it's Jeffrey Christian of CPM Group. It's about 11.25 on Tuesday, the 31st of January here in New York. Gold's trading around 19.35. Silver's around 23.65 at this point. Uh, bulk prices had fallen sharply this morning uh, on a stronger dollar primarily, uh, reflecting expectations of the outcome of the FOMC meeting at the Federal Reserve Bank uh, today and tomorrow. Uh, but uh, have they come back? I want to talk a little bit about central bank gold policies and practices today, and then I'll end with a little bit of an update on our, our market uh, views for gold and silver. There continues to be a tremendous amount of misinformation put out by really, I could call them partisans, but that's sort of bastardizing the, the, the word partisans, people who market precious metals based on fear and misinformation. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation about what central banks are doing with gold and how and why they're doing it. And, and so I wanted to talk about the policies and the practices. Now, first, let's start with a long view. This is net central bank sales. We call them official transactions, really going back since 1950. And you can see from 1950 to 1966, Central banks were net buyers of large amounts of gold. And that basically reflected the fact that we were on a dollar gold standard and gold was used for uh, international trade and capital settlements. You had dollars, you would turn them over to the U.S. Treasury and you would get gold at $35 an ounce. Um, so you saw central banks being net accumulators. That ended around 1967. You saw this big amount of, of gold, 45 million ounces of gold sold by central banks, not necessarily because they wanted to sell, but because private individuals and corporations were saying, we have all these dollars. You think that the price of gold is $35 an ounce or that the price of dollar is $35 an ounce. Here's my dollars. Give me your gold. Uh, in April of 1968, uh, President Johnson of the United States closed the private uh, sector gold window and said, if you're a private individual or a corporation, you no longer can turn in your, your dollars for gold. 1971, uh, Richard Nixon followed that up by closing the public sector gold window, which was uh, for central banks of other countries to say, we have a bunch of dollars. Let's uh, give me your gold. Uh, you saw a period of what they call demonetization of gold, really from 1971 to 1980. That changed. During that period of time, you can see three bars where central banks sold a lot of gold. That was primarily the IMF and the U.S. Treasury selling, I believe it was about 100 million ounces. Uh, some of it was not sold. It was repatriated from the IMF back to its member countries. Uh, and then uh, other parts were given, uh, the central banks had the uh, option to buy additional gold, and then uh, private sector had a right to buy additional gold from the IMF sales. Starting in the early 80s, you started seeing demonetization continue with central bank selling. In the 1980s, it was relatively small amounts. There was a lot of gold that was being leased by central banks at that time. Uh, they had gold that was a remnant of the old dollar gold standard. It was sitting there gathering dust, not paying interest. Central uh, Private banks, I was at J. Aaron, and we were one of the first ones to go to central banks and say, hey, we'd like to borrow your gold. And they'd say, how are you going to do that? I said, well, we'll borrow your gold. We'll pay you interest on it. Uh, and central banks started lending a lot of that gold out to earn interest. They were only earning 30 basis points, 50 basis points, 80 basis points, but it was better than nothing. And we would do things like where we would take their gold that they held at the New York Fed, we would borrow it, and when we unwound the gold lease, we would return good delivery gold in London, which is what they where they really preferred it. A lot of the gold, almost all of the gold that was at the New York Fed held by central banks was not good delivery gold by current standards in the 1980s because the good delivery standards had changed in 1979, 1980. And this was gold that was accumulated in the 1950s. So we would return upgraded gold in London where you could store the gold at the Bank of England 
and you can lend it out to other people. In New York, Fed only stored gold for other central banks at the time. And so therefore, if you were a private bank and you wanted to borrow that gold to mobilize it, use it in leasing out to clients, jewelers, producers, in, in investment uh, sales groups, uh, you couldn't have it at the New York Fed. You had to move it across the street to Chase. Now there isn't a tunnel underneath uh, Maiden Lane. You had to pick it up, take it upstairs, move it across the street, and then take it back downstairs. Or preferably you would move it from New York to London. And in our gold yearbook, we have a chart which shows you the amount of gold that was held at the New York Fed for central banks. And you could see a steady decline in the 80s and 90s. In the 90s, that leasing activity was added to by actual outright sales. And initially, that was central banks in Europe that were opting into the euro uh, and the European central banking system, which was slated to come on stream in January 1999. And then the Swiss and the British, who were not opting into the euro and the ECB, waited as gentlemen until 1999 to start their sales. And the Swiss sold something in excess of 43 million ounces from 1999 onward through public auctions. And the Bank of England sold about 10 million ounces. In each case, about 50% of the gold that they had. So you saw that period of gold sales extend really up until 2007, and 50 million ounces of the 1999 through 2007 sales were actually those two banks, the Swiss National Bank and the Bank of England. Changed, and then at, starting in 2008, you started seeing central bank buying. Now, there are two distinct groups of central banks, and both of them were operating under the same Guys, let me just go here. My next chart is looking just through 2000 till the present. And uh, my next chart, I'll just jump ahead for a second, is 2004 to, to the present. But let's go here. Two groups of central banks. Those central banks that were of major countries that were major trading uh, uh, countries in the period 1950, 1960, 1970, when you had gold being used for international settlements. And those central banks had accumulated an enormous amount of gold. I'll show you later. And gold was 75%, 85%, 90, 95, 98% of their, their monetary reserves. They were way mm -hmm. too exposed to gold. So in the 90s, they were reducing their gold. There were a few central banks that got rid of all their gold, but most of them were like the Swiss or the British. They said, let's get rid of half of our gold and let's generate a stockpile of foreign exchange uh, reserves uh, that we can use to defend our currencies. When you had to defend your currencies in the 50s and 60s and, and 70s, you had most of your monetary reserves in, in gold, and you'd have to sell that gold in a smaller, less liquid, more uh, opaque market to generate dollars that you could then use to buy your currency to support it. So by moving your currency, moving your monetary reserves from gold into dollars, that got you ready to defend your currency in a more liquid, less uh, opaque market in the dollar. Uh, show you charts later. So you had central banks of major industrialized economies saying, we want to diversify our monetary reserves away from gold to include more currencies. Up until 2007, that was sort of the, 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 the way it was working. Starting around 2007, 2008, you had any number of emerging economies and developing economies that were generating large inflows of dollars and other currencies through their export programs. The Asian tigers, China, uh, you know, South Korea, Japan, uh, the Philippines, Thailand, uh, tai Taiwan, um, China, the People's Republic of China, all had large foreign exchange currencies and very little gold. 
because they hadn't accumulated gold in their central bank holdings because they weren't major trading counterparts prior to the 1980s, 1990s. They started buying gold because they wanted to diversify their monetary reserves away from currencies by adding some gold. Not a lot. I showed you a chart last Friday in our video showing you emerging economies that mostly have less than 10 or 20% of their foreign exchange reserves or their monetary reserves in gold. But some diversification away from the dollar and away from other currencies into gold. It's the same impulse that you saw with the industrialized economies, but it's the mirror image. The industrial economies were trying to diversify their monetary reserves by reducing their gold and increasing their foreign exchange. The emerging economies were trying to diversify their monetary reserves by reducing their foreign exchange and buying more gold. That's the why and the wherefore of what's been going on in terms of central bank policies and why you're seeing central banks from emerging economies build their gold reserves. And as I said in last week's video, with a few exceptions like Venezuela, which doesn't have any foreign exchange reserves because they've destroyed their export uh, industries, or Russia, uh, you know, which is kind of a pariah state, um, most central banks and emerging economies are not building up massive amounts of gold and putting a large portion of their foreign uh, monetary reserves into gold. They're putting small percentages. In, in China, which has been one of the more aggressive purchasers of gold for, for monetary reserve purposes, they're up to 3% of their wealth uh, of the central bank reserve, monetary reserves in gold. India, another big buyer, they're up to 8%. So it's a relatively small but important part of their monetary reserves. My next chart is just a close-up of the last several years. Again, you can, you know, we're showing you here the gross purchases by some central banks, the gross reductions by other central banks. You can see since 2010 or so, there's been very little amounts of gold sold by central banks. Most of the central banks that wanted to reduce their gold holdings had actually done so by 2007, 2006. Uh, so the purchase, the sales were have been smaller since that time, uh, while other central banks have accelerated their purchases <clears throat> since 2010. This is a table from our Precious Metals Advisory. It's a little out of date. We actually have updated data, but we're not showing it to you. It'll be in our 9th of February, uh, 2023 uh, Precious Metals Advisory. This is through November, but you'll see that China doesn't show up as a country increasing its reserves. After January 6th, the People's Bank of China had, uh, announced that it had in fact bought or added a million ounces of gold to its monetary reserves. It doesn't show in November. It doesn't show up in here because it wasn't announced and, and public until after January 6th. Uh, it'll show up in our February Precious Metals Advisory. So you can see here, what, about 18 uh, countries buying gold. It's not at all 180 central banks of the world buying gold, but it's a diverse group of largely uh, emerging economies buying gold and buying significant amounts, 1.6, 1.4, 1.1 million ounces. China, not on here, 1 million ounces. Qatar, 1.1 million ounces. And then some smaller things like 10,000 ounces for France, 10,000 ounces for Albania, 9,000 ounces for Belarus. This is another chart. Uh, this is the second part of that table. In our Precious Metals Advisory, we have <clears throat> countries increasing and countries decreasing reserves. And you, here you can see other central banks, and surprisingly, Kazakhstan, which I guess is having some economic issues, uh, was the largest seller of gold through November of last year, about 700,000 ounces of gold. It has built up its reserves to about 12.9 <clears throat> at the beginning of the year. It's down to 12.2 million ounces of gold. Other central banks, much more smaller, uh, sales. And then at the bottom, you can see 
through November, through official reports, 7 million ounces. It'll be a little bit over that because we haven't had, well, we'll add December in our precious metals advisory next week, and we'll add China's million ounces. So it's going to be over 8 million ounces. We haven't added those 10 million ounces that uh, have been said to have been purchased by central banks, but not added to official monetary reserves so far. We just haven't added them. When it becomes clear that actually that happened, if that actually happened, we're not quite sure that it has, we'll add it. Uh, but we tend not to change our data based on things that we're not quite sure actually happened. I just went back here to show you again the countries that were buyers. These two charts show you central bank gold purchases relative to the price. And you can see that broadly when the price is rising or higher, central banks buy less gold. And when the price is falling or lower, they buy more gold. And then when the price rises again, they buy less gold. The chart on the left is the price of gold versus purchases, uh, net purchases, net additions to monetary reserves. The chart on the right is the percent change in the price of gold. So when the price fall sharply as it did in 2013, they bought a lot more gold. And the same is true in 2021. They, they stepped up their gold purchases about... Uh, 50%, 40%. This is gold's role as a monetary reserve asset. And you can see back here, well, I'll show you a chart in a second. Gold used to be a very important part of the gold, uh, of, of monetary reserves uh, during the dollar gold standard. After we severed the ties, you had this massive, like 13% per annum growth in foreign exchange reserves. Uh, very large. But the gold price is also free to float. So the percentage of monetary reserves that was in gold actually has in, uh, increased from the 1990s, early 80s. It's, you know, um, the percentage increase is, is down from where it was prior during the gold standard. But the dollar value of the gold holdings has increased sharply. And it's about 12% on a dollar value here. L little things there, IMF reserve position and special drawing rights. You can hardly see the, uh, the reserve position. Those are monetary reserve assets in addition to the foreign exchange and the gold. This is the percentage uh, table showing you. And yeah, it's up about 10, about 12% right now. But for a large part of the period of time from, say, 2000 onward, it was 10 to 12 percent has been in gold. And this is the composition of foreign exchange holdings. And you can see, you know, there was a period of time when central banks were moving into the dollar. That was the run up to the ECB. It peaked in 1999. Uh, and then it came, has, has come down slowly, but it's basically been 58 to 62 percent for most of the time since the early 80s in dollars. So the idea of moving away from dollars into gold doesn't hold up to mathematics scrutiny because there's so many dollars here relative to the gold. I put this up last week. We did an interview on the 17th of January with the Northern Miner, uh, Adrian Pocobelli. Really good interview, a little bit long. It's a podcast. But we got really into the details of China's uh, central bank's gold policies and practices. It's worth listening to if you actually want to know what actually or really is happening in terms of central bank gold policies toward gold and practices with gold. And finally, talking about the markets, uh, we've seen the prices showing seasonal strength. Uh, you've seen a lot of investors moving into gold for a variety of reasons, economic concerns, political and financial market concerns. Uh, gold and silver have done well. 
our expectation is that they will continue to do well. They did come off a little bit today. Uh, we issued trade recommendation uh, today, and we, we had issued a gold uh, recommendation a couple weeks ago saying that we thought they'd be profit-taking. Um, it didn't occur through yesterday, but it occurred a little bit this morning. Uh, we'd still sort of probably play gold to the short side on a very short-term basis uh, because of the FOMC meeting and the jobs report, uh, the FOMC announcement due tomorrow, FOMC's meeting today and tomorrow, and the jobs report on Friday. Uh, but we assume that we're going to issue a new short-term recommendation later in the week, and uh, whether it's long or short uh, will depend on what's going on after the FOMC meeting. Silver, uh, similar, you know, silver actually did fall to uh, the downside of objective that we had. It actually went through it. I think we were thinking it could go down to 2350. It got down to 2305 this morning. It's back up over 2350. Um, you might want to stand aside in silver for the next couple of days, see how the market reacts to the FOMC. Uh, our expectation is 25 basis point increase and some conversation about keeping interest rates uh, elevated, uh, slowing the rate of increase from what it was last year, keeping interest rates elevated to squeeze inflation. I think the jobs report will have a lot to do with that and what we see with in terms of jobs and unemployment rates uh, over the next month or two, really over the rest of the year. Our expectation prices will stay strong in the first quarter, come off some in the second and third quarters, and then probably be rising again in the fourth quarter. There's a variety of political, economic, and financial, as well as gold and silver fundamental factors behind those views. Those factors and our views of them and our interpretation and analyses of them are all available in our yearbooks, which are coming out soon, and in our precious metals advisory uh, and other reports that we produce. You may pre-order our gold, silver, platinum yearbooks uh, on our website. You can see a lot of other free reads and videos, and you can buy other research and consulting services that we do. We are posting reports now that we produce for Monex, Precious Metals, and Gold Bullion International, both on our own website and on our Bloomberg pages. That's all I have for today. It's been a long conversation again. I apologize for that. Uh, but these are very important issues that are really being misrepresented in the markets. And CPM Group tries to, with these videos, dispel some of the myths and misrepresentations that can cost investors money and give investors a unbiased, accurate, analytically research-driven view of what's really going on in the markets so they can make money in precious metals instead of losing it. See you at the end of the week. Feast of St. Blaise is coming up on Friday, and we'll do another video then.